uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's day of seminar. And uh, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Heather Lynch from the Department of Ecology and Evolution in our university. So Dr. Lynch did her bachelor's degree in physics from Princeton University. And then for graduate school, she went to Harvard, where she did a master's in physics at Harvard. But then she decided to switch, and her doctoral degree is in evolutionary biology. And her PhD thesis was on the interaction between forest fires and insect populations, and the distribution of insect populations. Um, after her doctorate, she was a postdoctoral associate at the University of Maryland. And prior to com coming to Stony Brook, she uh, was a research associate or research scientist uh, in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And now she is on the faculty here in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. Um, so uh, in recognition of the, her, the excellence of her work, she has won recently won the NSF Career Award, which is given to very few um, uh, young scientists uh, in recognition of their promise by the NSF. And when she was a graduate assistant at Harvard, she uh, won, uh, she was given the award for excellence in teaching. And her uh, thesis for, uh, in, in the physics department at Princeton, which was on low temperature physics on the Kondo effect was recognized as the best undergraduate thesis by the American Physical Society for that year. So there's a trail of excellence uh, that Heather Lynch has established. And uh, in, among, uh, in addition to her regular research, she is the co-author of a voluminous book on the, um, uh, on the environment of the Antarctic. And she advises the US State Department in their uh, negotiations for the International Antarctic Treaty, and in support of that work, she has uh, written eight papers, detailed papers, uh, helping advise the State Department. And today she is going to speak to us about the impact of climate change on penguin populations in the Antarctic. So let us welcome Heather Lynch. Thank you, Dr. Thanks for that introduction. Um, some of you may know me from, uh, from biometry. I teach uh, biometry and ecology and evolution. And for those students of you in the audience, I just want to say that um, next spring, I'll be also teaching a seminar in non-parametric methods. So keep an eye out. That might be of interest for some of you uh, here in uh, the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about climate change winners and losers, penguin population dynamics on the Antarctic Peninsula. And this is work that I'm doing now at Stony Brook, and it's in close collaboration with an NGO called Oceanides. And so my own, my own position is very much uh, sort of shared between the university and my work at the university and, and my role at this NGO. Uh, so they play a major role in this as well. Let's see where my point is. Ah, there we go. So my alternate title for today was actually The Oak in the Reeds, What Aesop's Fable Can Tell Us About the Impact of Climate Change on the Pagasalid Penguins. And for those of you that are not familiar with this fable, I, I just include the following uh, summary. Uh, in a controversy between some oak and some reeds, the oak upgraded the reeds, but they were weak and wavering and gave way to every blast. While he scorned, he said, to bend to the most raging tempest, which he despised as they whistled by him. A little while after this dispute, it blew a most violent storm. The reeds plied and gave way to the gust and still recovered themselves again without receiving any damage. But the oak, stubbornly resisting the hurricane, was torn up by the roots. And so I hope you'll see this is the theme, really, of my own uh, thinking and my own work on how the different pygacella penguins uh, respond to climate change and how successful they are in, in doing so. So just to give you a summary of my, my work and what my lab does, my lab is focused on building uh, what I call a synthetic technology-enabled approach to Antarctic biodiversity monitoring that leverages resources from private industry, from pri uh, private philanthropy, and also traditional Antarctic gatekeepers such as the National Science Foundation. So in the field, my, my, group, um, oops. my group works on, I forgot there's a whole other piece of equipment here. Um, 
uh, about 90% of all the work that we do is off commercial cruise ships, um, but we also work off NSF research vessels as well as private yachts. And we have this multi-platform biodiversity monitoring network that we link together with GPS data, field notes, photo documentation, and increasingly high resolution commercial satellite imagery. But the idea is to put this all together to get a, a really comprehensive picture about the uh, Antarctic biodiversity, how it's distributed in space, and how it might be changing in time. So the real question that drives my research, or the research I'll be talking about, is how is the Antarctic ecosystem responding to climate change? And the motivation is that midwinter temperatures on the western Antarctic Peninsula have increased four to five degrees Celsius since 1944. Which when you think about the kinds of temperatures that, that we think about at temperate latitudes is really a remarkable amount of change in a very short period of time. And in fact, at Vernaski Station, uh, which is sort of right in the middle of the area in, in which I work, they've seen some of the highest uh, temperature increases anywhere on the planet. So we really have an area that is an excellent opportunity to understand how individual organisms, and in fact, whole communities are responding to rapid climate change. So the area that I work in is sort of not Antarctica proper. I work on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is this thumb of land that sticks out into the Southern Ocean here. And it happens to contain most of the biological diversity, at least the macro scale biological diversity of the entire Antarctic continent. Because it's very marine influenced, it has a lot more bare rock, um, it's uh, much more biologically productive than some of these other areas in which uh, there's not as much diversity. So it's a fairly small part of the whole Antarctic continent um, but it's actually still a really large area in which to be working. So we're talking an area of coastline which is about 400 kilometers by 1,000 kilometers. And this poses some real challenges. How do we survey um, biodiversity over such a large regional scale uh, in an area that's sort of very, sort of traditionally very, very difficult place to work? And so how do we develop logistically feasible sampling strategies? And the, the approach that, that I'm taking here is the Antarctic Site Inventory, which is a biological monitoring program that actually predates my own work considerably. It started in 1994, and it meets this needs via opportunistic vessel-based surveys. So whereas most of Antarctic research is station-based, it's very detailed information about particular populations of animals near a research station, um, the Antarctic Site Inventory is really monitoring all of the animals over a huge regional scale um, in an opportunistic fashion. So to give you a sense of what the data actually look like, uh, this chart is, is a little bit uh, dated, but I think it gives you the right idea. Uh, in this matrix on the left, I have one row for every site in the inventory, so every site that we've surveyed, and a column for every year since 1979 to 2009, and all the little filled in squares are sites and years for which we have some census data on the breeding penguins at that site. And all the gray dots are data coming from other projects, and all the black dots are data coming from, from our project, my project, the Antarctic Site Inventory. And you can see that there are some sites where we have very, very good time series, so that it's black all the way across. And these are sites which are very popular tourist locations. So we might actually get there 10 or up to 15 times every year because the cruise ships that we're working on go back there over and over again. But there are some sites that maybe we've been to once in, in 20 years, or, or maybe twice. Uh, so my job, the reason that, that I became involved with this back in 2006, is that it takes some, someone with an interest in statistical modeling to really put all this together and try and build population models over such a patchy uh, data set. There really are three very unique goals with this project, and one is to track patterns of occupancy. So we're interested, I'm interested in understanding where the penguins are breeding, and importantly, where these penguins are not breeding. So that's, that's one of our goals, is simply to assess presence and absence. The second goal is we want to estimate um, total population size. We, we really do want to know how many breeding pairs of penguins are in a particular region. And the reason um, gets to trying to develop a sustainable fishery in the Antarctic, we really need to know how many krill predators there are working, foraging in these oceans. And I'm very involved with um, CAMLAR, which is the body uh, working in, on that problem. One quick yeah. question before you leave. Yes. The, the various colored dots, do those represent uh, stable communities of penguins, or are they just places where you're able to sample? Very good question. So. Um, 
where we started was uh, just going to those sites where the cruise ships were growing. Increasingly so, particularly with the yacht-based work, we're going to all the breeding colonies that are known to exist. And now with the satellite imagery that I'll talk about at the end, we're actually able to get a complete map. Um, and the, the third goal is to, <coughs> is to estimate trend. So we're not only interested in where they're breeding and how many there are, but how are these populations changing in time? And with the goal being to understand the drivers underneath this, this, these trends that we're seeing. So if our goal was just any one of these, the ideal sampling scheme would be fairly straightforward. But actually meeting all three of these goals at the same time is pretty challenging. And I'm heartened somewhat by some, some earlier work showing that what's called an augmented random revisit sampling design can actually have high power for both trend detection and absolute abundance. And so what this means is that augmented random revisit would be that you have some sites that you go to year in, year out, perfect time series at some sites, and a random sampling of the remaining sites each year. And so we don't exactly have that. We don't actually have any control over where we go on the cruise ships, but it's it's sort of approximately like that. And so I don't think that we're too far off to um, something uh, to a sampling design that can give us a lot of information about these three, uh, three questions we're interested in. So the focal species of the Antarctic site inventory um, are, are three species of penguins, the Adelie penguin, the chinstrap penguin, and the gentoo penguin, all of which are in the same genus, the Pygocellus. And we also are particularly interested in three flying bird species, so southern giant petrel, kelp gull, and the blue-eyed shag. But my own work is very focused on these three groups, these three species of the Pygocellus penguins, because they are very, very closely related, and their life history traits are very similar, but they differ in key ways, and that's, that's going to be the focus of my talk. So no talk about my work is really complete without at least saying a little bit about how we do this work. Because people assume that we do a considerable amount of interpolation or extrapolation or estimation, when in fact what we do is we really go out to these sites and we count every single breeding pair or chick that we find. And it, it's not rocket science, honestly, when we're out there. Uh, we stand outside these colonies, we're counting individual nests or chicks with a handheld tally counter. We count every group three times. If we get three counts within 5%, then, then we move on. That's sort of our bar for moving on to the next little group. And the real challenge is that we usually only have about two to three hours to complete these censuses working off the cruise ships. Again, we are really hitchhikers on these cruise ships. The cruise ships will not wait for us, so we, we're very limited in the amount of time we have available. And sometimes this is easy, this is a fairly small group, and that's me counting them, but we get much larger groups. And this island in the bottom, for example, has about 120,000 breeding pairs. So we're, we're very constrained in what we can do in the field, and it turns out that we can just experience shows that we can count up to about 5,000 breeding pairs in the time that we have available. Beyond that, we have to get a bit more clever and in some sites, we can gain some elevation over the colony and take these giant panoramics and actually count uh, after the fact. You can see here we zoom in and we zoom in, and we would count this, this bird because it's incubating a nest, but not the partner. The partner's just standing. And what we're really interested in is how many breeding pairs there are. And so this gets us up to about maybe 10,000 or 20,000 breeding pairs. For larger colonies, we're moving increasingly to satellites, and I'll talk about that at the end. So my talk is going to be to contrast the gentoo penguin and the Adelie penguin. Again, they're in the same genus. Uh, they're very similar in their life history traits in many ways, but the very first thing that distinguishes them is that they have fairly different ranges, breeding ranges. So all of the gentoo penguin, known gentoo penguin breeding areas are these red triangles. The Adelie penguin, um, so the gentoo penguin is more of a sub-Antarctic species. It breeds from the south of South America down what's called the Scotia Arc, this chain of islands down to the Antarctic Peninsula. The Adelie penguins, by contrast, are one of the two true Antarctic species as a circumpolar distribution. And it's argued uh, they go back and forth between Adelies and emperors, but it's one of the most southerly breeding penguins in the world. And, and we're lucky that there's this area of overlap between the Western Antarctic Peninsula and the South Sandwich Islands that both of these species are actually breeding in the same areas, and oftentimes actually breeding in the very same colony. So we have mixed colonies of Adelis and Gentoos in this area. And that allows us to, to study how these two species uh, differ in their response to climate change in a part of the world where it's warming as rapidly uh, probably as any other place on the planet. 
So just to, to illustrate the, the, the first difference between these two species, I've put their known breeding um, populations on top of a map of November sea ice. And November is the breeding season. It's the austral spring, and the birds are setting up their nests. And these red areas have a 0% ice cover. So on average, these are totally open water. And here we have 100% ice cover. And what's remarkable is that we have a very clear barrier for the gentoo penguin. It turns out the gentoo penguins cannot breed where there's more than 50% sea ice in November. So that's their threshold, 50% above that. They simply can't breed. But the Adelie penguin has no such qualms about breeding near sea ice or in amongst the sea ice. Um, and, and in fact, like I said, it has a, a circumpolar distribution. So it breeds all the way down the peninsula and all the way around the continent. So that's one of the most striking differences between these two species. So my talk today really is going to be a tale of two penguins. And the first sort of piece of information about these two species is that the gentoo penguin likes open water conditions. It's a subantarctic species. And the Adeli not only can tolerate sea ice, but it's a, in fact, in many ways, it's a sea ice obligate. So just to come back to my, uh, my matrix here, uh, the goal, or one of the main goals, is to model trends in the abundance of breeding pairs. And if, if, we, if we look back at 2009-10, which was the last major sort of analysis that I did of these data, we had 70 locations that had at least two years of census data. So I need at least two data points to, to assess trend. Uh, no amount of statistics will get around that problem. Um, but but well, you see that for the Adeli penguin, there were 24 sites, Gentoo penguin, 45 sites, and Chinstrap penguin, 29 sites. And this really is a huge paradigm shift relative to what uh, had been done in the past, which is people were focused on a single breeding population. So they would have very, very good time series of a particular breeding population, where in fact we have very patchy time series, but we might be looking at, in this case, 70 different populations, all sort of looking at their dynamics all at the same time. And in fact, when you update this, as I've done recently after this season, we just got the last folks out of the field um, last week. And just in the last three years, we've gone from 70 sites to 109 sites that we now have enough data for to assess trend. We've almost doubled um, the number of Adelie penguin populations that we, we have enough data to assess trend. And this is really a, a function of an extremely intense effort to go out and sample particular colonies where we know that the information we had was particularly out of date. So I'm really pleased with how much more information we have now, and I'm, I'm working on a new analysis as we speak. So the, the goal in modeling trends uh, in the abundance of breeding pairs is really driven by a couple of key facts in penguin, bio uh, I would say penguin biology. And the first is that penguins are highly site faithful, and they breed in fixed breeding colonies. So abundances are not comparable uh, between and among colonies, so I cannot use the information from one island to infer anything about the population at another island. I can't extrapolate it that way as I could if these were a density. I could uh, extrapolate um, in that case, but here I can't. These are really independent breeding populations, all evolving according to their own dynamics, and therefore different sites do not represent sample replication. The second factor is that these are large, stationary, um, in, in principle, easily enumerated species. So we're not talking about a case where we have tropical birds and we might be just hearing a tiny, tiny fraction of all the birds at the site. In theory, we can actually count all the birds that are present at the location. Um, but because the timing of our census is random relative to their own breeding timing, the number that are present is going to be less than the total number of breeding pairs that attempted breeding in that year because we might be a little bit ahead of the peak of breeding, a little bit behind the peak of breeding, and we actually don't know where we are relative to the breeding cycle. <coughs> and like most long-lived seabirds, penguins are capable of skipping breeding, which means that the number of pairs that actually attempt breeding in any one year is something less, maybe 80% of all breeding age pairs um, in that cohort. And we have to consider that when, when modeling their, their dynamics as well. So the ideal approach would integrate multiple measures of population abundance. It would account for sample-specific observation errors, which is to say that sometimes we go out there and we have an hour and we can only do a rough estimate. Sometimes we get five hours and we can get a very good count. We can literally just very carefully count every single pair. So our observation errors are very different from census to census. It should be highly robust to missing data. This is obviously our biggest challenge. And it should account for multiple sources of error what are called process error and, and measurement error, and I'll talk about that in a second. 
So this is really my only slide that involves any equations, but I wanted to put it up there to, to give you a sense of the kinds of models that I'm working with. Um, principally hierarchical Bayesian models that, that include both process error and measurement error. And then the key, the key equation here is in pink, and it's that the, the number of pairs that are actually present at the time of the census is some binomial distribution. It's some fraction of the overall number of pairs uh, that tried to breed in that year. And this detection probability, like I said, really has to do with the fact that there is a breeding um, cycle. And so pairs, pairs um, establish nests and then, and then nests will fail and those birds will leave. And we're not always getting at the, to the site at the peak of breeding. That's where we'd like to be. We're somewhere ahead or behind of that curve and we don't know where we are. And then the dynamics is this state space model here where the total number of pairs breeding in year T is equal to the total number of pairs breeding in year T minus one times an exponential growth or decline. And then epsilon T is what I would call process error. And it captures the fact that the, the actual dynamics are stochastic and not necessarily understood. That there's some amount of randomness in the population growth rate from year to year. And the measurement model simply says that we don't always get a perfect count when we're out there. That the pairs that we count is gonna be, we, we would hope, uh, sort of normally distributed about the number of pairs that were present at the site, but there is some measurement error. And again, that measurement error is something we estimate when we're in the field, and that's gonna change from census to census. So to give you a sense of what these, the, the model outputs actually look like, here are uh, a time series of Gen 2 penguins at a place called Almirante Brown. And uh, the, the data here and then the, the estimated amount of, of measurement error with the error bars. And our, these hierarchical Bayesian models give us credible intervals for what we think the true underlying number of breeding pairs uh, was for that year. And here I have the, what we call the posterior distribution for the exponential rate of population growth. Um, which is which is B. So um, in this case, we have a fairly, for us, this would be considered a fairly complete time series, so we can get fairly tight estimates of what the population growth rate is for this particular population. <coughs> and these models allow us to, to predict what those populations would be in the future. So here I just predict uh, from 2013 to uh, 2018, and you can see that these prediction intervals really blow up. And the reason they blow up is that the main source of uncertainty is actually the the inherent stochasticity of these populations. That there's just a huge amount of interannual variation in how many, in, in reproductive success, so the number of pairs that actually return to breed each year, and that's, that's driving on our, our uncertainty far more so than our own ability or inability to actually count the penguins when we're in the field. So the biological question here is, can we relate this exponential rate of population growth uh, to can we understand what the drivers are of B? What, what causes B to be what it is? And can we understand what causes this epsilon of T to be what it is? Because it turns out that some sites we would call hypervariable, that for whatever reason there are some sites that have a huge amount of interannual variation and other sites which have relatively low interannual variation. And there's some natural drivers of distribution and change that might be things like chlorophyll A, which we use as a very crude measure of biological productivity. Um, sea surface temperature, bathymetry uh, might affect um, why one site is more productive than another. Um, sea ice, there's a whole host of things, as, as you guys know, uh, as to what might be driving um, these changes in trends. Yeah? In your previous slide, are you accounting for any possible population crash over to overbreeding or overconsumption of resources? It's a great question. So the models that we have now do not include any kind of density dependence. That is literally, that <coughs> is task number one um, for, for, the, for this next round, is that we really need, we, we find strong evidence of density dependence in some sites which have increased, 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 and we find that they plateau. And, and I think unless you include density dependence, you might think that the dynamics have changed, and I think they've just run out of resources, because these, particularly Gen 2s, are central place foragers. So really, there's only so many that can breed at a site before they, they run out of resources. Um, so density dependence is the very next thing to, that I want to do. In addition to sort of natural drivers of change, we have um, anthropogenic drivers of change, so particularly tourism, both visitation and tourism-related marine traffic. Um, some of these breeding populations might see three or 400 people every day, the whole breeding season. Um, these are incredibly crowded places, believe it or not, and so one of the things we want to know is whether or not all this activity is, is having an impact on their population growth rates. So, 
to cut to sort of the, the results, at least the results up to about that 2009, 2010 season um, can be seen here. And what, what I found was that the, the overwhelming correlate of uh, driving Gen 2 population changes was a change in November sea ice coverage. And so on the x-axis here, on the left, we have areas that where November sea ice coverage is declining rapidly, and there we see Gen 2 populations are increasing rapidly. But where November sea ice is stable, we also find stable Gen 2 populations. And, and hopefully you guys are looking at this, and, and you're looking at these, these points up here and being rather concerned about them. I certainly was kind of interested in them at first. And if you pull out these seven locations, it turns out that the trend is still significant. But in this point, it's a little it's a little beside the point because obviously what's going on that's really interesting is way up here what's going on at these colonies. And it turns out those seven populations are seven newly established populations since 1979. So we have at least seven. It turns out there, there are more right now. There are at least seven populations that are newly established in the last 30 years. And these populations grow unbelievably quickly once they become established. In fact, so quickly that it can't be explained by reproduction alone. There must be a huge amount of immigration. And again, that immigration is rather surprising to us because these are very site-faithful species. So we don't expect these populations to be moving um, quickly at all. But in some of these, Bisco Point here is almost a hockey stick curve that we have um, you know, a couple of breeding pair here up to 1995. And it, it, it takes off almost like a wall. And suddenly we have six, eight, hundred pairs. Um, so incredibly rapid growth at these colonies. So the, the story, the ecological picture, is that we have this, this wall, this moving <coughs> southward migration of Gentoo population breeding, that the Gentoos are actually tracking this 50% contour line, that as the spring sea ice breaks up earlier and earlier, the Gentoo penguins are able to establish new colonies at the southern range margin. Um, and, and this track in this migration is actually one of the things that, that we're really most interested in. Uh, and, and it's a rare case where we have a very clear picture of a, of a physical constraint, um, a clear role for climate change, and we can actually see this uh, year in, year out. We find gentoos breeding further and further south. So where they're going is a, is a big question. It's something I, again, spending a lot of time thinking about. And to get to that question, um, I'll talk more about the yacht work, but that was the number one goal of this yacht expedition we did just last month, was to go survey, we surveyed the entire coastline um, through their southern range margin and, and further south. So this whole area, we literally surveyed every patch of, of bare rock looking for more gentoo penguins, and in fact found a lot of really interesting stuff. And the story with, with uh, Adelie penguins and chinstrap penguins is slightly more complex. Uh, it turns out that the best sort of correlate of what their populations are doing is some combination <coughs> of sea surface temperature and chlorophyll A. So here I have the first principal component of sea surface temperature and chlorophyll A. And we see areas that are uh, uh, colder, sort of what we think of as being more biologically productive, that Adelie populations are stable. But areas where, where we think biological productivity is declining, we see those Adelie populations are declining um, as well. And in fact, this picture holds true for chin straps. So I'm going to talk about chin straps uh, later on, but Adelis and chin straps seem to be um, sort of responding to the same environmental cues. And this fits in with a study that was done by another group um, in 2009 looking at long term changes in chlorophyll A, which again we think of as, as being some measure of biological productivity. And these areas, uh, in the southern part of the Western Antarctic Peninsula has actually had stable or increasing amounts of chlorophyll A, and that's exactly where we see Adelie populations holding steady. As soon as we get to this northern part in the South Shetland Islands, those Adelie populations are declining rapidly, and in fact we've had some populations blink out altogether. So the, biologically the chain is of, of thinking is that, oops, higher concentrations of chlorophyll A um, is associated with more phytoplankton, which would be associated with more krill, um, and more prey for these krill specialists like the chinstrap and the adelie. Gentoo penguins also eat a considerable amount of krill, but they do have a more varied diet. They include more fish in their diet. They, they appear to have a broader um, set of dietary preferences. So it, it appears to hit the, the adelies and the chinstraps um, harder when, when we have a decline in krill. And krill is something that's very hard to get at directly, and that's why we're sort of making some inferences starting with chlorophyll A, because actually understanding the spatial distribution and temporal distribution of krill populations is, is, is immensely challenging. 
So this spatially integrated assessment allows us to estimate peninsula-wide rates of population change, and that's what these histograms are here. We find strong evidence that regionally adelie populations are declining, and even stronger evidence that Gen Z populations are, are increasing rapidly at the regional scale. And in fact, I've used that increase in the Gen Z population to argue that the Gen Z penguin really should be upgraded from its current near-threatened status. Um, I think that there are, I think almost all of the other penguins have on net declining populations. Um, and this is an, it's all laid out in this new book uh, I authored a chapter of, Biology and Conservation of the World's Penguins found broad scale declines in most penguins, and I've been in a weird position arguing that, in fact, the Gen 2 penguin uh, is actually increasing, and so we need to, I think, reassess its own status. Um, are the adelies actually dying off, or are they migrating south, and you just can't get down there to see them? Great question. So we don't know for sure. We, uh, we don't know if they're, we don't know if they're moving, and in fact, but they're so site faithful that banding studies on adelies are so those those adelies are found incredibly rarely at any other site. So we're not actually searching in the areas where they're probably going, but on smaller scales, we've never found them to go anywhere else. Um, at least, you know, we, we look for banded penguins, banded by other groups, and maybe once every five years, we'll find one banded penguin at a site where it wasn't banded. And this is, they, they ban thousands every year. So um, we don't think they're moving, but we can't say for sure. So I've kind of added a piece of information here to our tale of two penguins. The Gen 2 populations are expanding where November sea ice is declining and new habitat is being made available for colonization, but the Adelie populations are declining where krill is less available or where we think krill is less available because there are areas of decreasing biological productivity. Now I'm not gonna talk about this work, but I'm involved in a long-term collaboration to look at uh, penguin diet through stable isotope analysis of eggshells. And we find that the Gen 2 penguin, as I said, has a less specialized diet. Um, but Adelie penguins are krill specialists, although we find them eating more fish on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which indicates that um, they would prefer to eat krill. So the fact that we're finding them eating more fish means that they, they're probably krill limited on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. So briefly, just gonna talk about the role that climate may play in penguin breeding phenology, and that's the timing of penguin breeding relative to the calendar year. And this was a study I did to understand um, what's driving clutch initiation. So that's when the penguins actually complete their two egg clutch, that, what drives the date on which that happens. And the model included four factors, uh, latitude, uh, which can affect day length, year, so looking at an overall trend, species, these species have species specific breeding phenologies, and the most interesting of which is temperature. And I'll spare you the details, but what I found after, after a long time of looking at these data was that the, the key driver here is mean October temperature. And the reason that's important is because the major barrier to penguins breeding is finding snow-free areas on which to breed. So the penguins want to be like this Adelie here, high and dry, nice little nest with its two eggs. They don't want to be like this Gen 2 at the bottom. Its nest has basically been completely flooded. Those eggs will not hatch. And so they have to wait until the snow melts out, but if they wait too long, then they risk getting caught by the, by the fall, um, and the chicks will not actually uh, fledge before, before the cold weather comes back. So we found about five days delay in breeding phenology as you go further and further south, so that wasn't uh, unexpected. And we find that the Pygocellus penguins breed in a predictable sequence, and again, this was not unexpected. This was um, what had been found in, in other studies. Um, so the Adelis typically, if they're all breeding at the same site, Adelis will show up and uh, initiate their clutches first, very closely followed by the Gentoo penguins, and then about almost three weeks later, the Chinstrap penguins. But what's interesting here is that breeding synchrony is highly variable. So how, how synchronous are different penguins breeding at the same site to one another? And it turns out that Chinstraps are by far the most synchronous, followed by the Adeli. And you look at the spread in the Gentoo, this actually comes from the, the data, uh, Gen 2 penguins are, are less synchronous, so uh, Gen 2s may be in various stages of clutch initiation or, or nest building all at the same site. What's really interesting is looking at what we would expect with uh, climate change, that as mean October temperatures get warmer, what happens? We find that all three of these species are able to advance breeding in response to warmer temperatures, but they're not all able to advance breeding at the same rate. So it turns out that uh, this is what a one degree Celsius rise in mean October temperatures would look like. 
and this is what a three degrees rise would look like. And you see by the time we get to three degrees Celsius, the gentoos have uh, jumped ahead of the adelies, that now on average the gentoo penguins are rising and initiating clutches before the adelies. So we have a relatively small increase in temperature, but we have a major <coughs> shift in the, the order in which these birds arrive. And the reason that's important is because gentoos and adelies, uh, we think that they compete for the best nesting spaces where they're breeding in amongst one another. And so now gentoos are able to establish dominance on those best sites. And the adelies that are arriving a little bit later may, they're smaller, they're not able to push the gentoos off, even if it's nest sites that were historically adelies. And I won't talk about it, but um, a colleague and I put out almost 50 remote cameras in the Antarctic. And so this is one of the things we're trying to study is these intra intra-colony dynamics of, of nest site dominance. So we're trying to, to get at this using those remote cameras. And we do have, in addition to all of that, an unexplained advance of clutch initiation of almost a fifth of a day per year. So not explained by mean October temperatures alone. And so this just gives you a sense of what the data look like. And I just want to point out that in this particular year, 2002, you can see that clutch initiation was delayed uh, from 30 days uh, almost to 50 days. And that was a particularly cold October. So we really are talking about a, almost a three week delay in clutch initiation due to um, a particularly cold uh, October in that year. So the, when you look at, at breeding phenology and climate change, the gentoos really went out three to nothing here over the adelies. The adelies are, sorry, the gentoos are a larger, more physically dominant penguin that can outcompete adelie penguins for prime nesting territory. And getting at those dynamics, like I said, is something that we're, we're working on. The second, the gentoo penguin is a resident species where the adelie penguin actually migrates away from the breeding colony in the winter. So the, the gentoo penguin has a real advantage because it has that local scale information about what the breeding site looks like. And as soon as the breeding site becomes uh, suitable for breeding, the gentoos can start breeding immediately. Whereas the adelies may not have those local cues. They might be way out in the open ocean foraging and they don't know when to turn around and come home. And this fits in with a much larger literature discussing the fact that resident species will be at an advantage relative to migrant species due to climate change, because they have those local scale cues that the migrant uh, species just don't. And finally, the greater synchrony and coloniality of the Adelie penguin constrains its phenological response to climate change. That because it's, it's, it's highly synchronous and they're breeding in these, they're, they're highly colonial, they're simply not able to adapt. We don't think they're able to adapt um, in the same way that the gentoo penguins are that have less synchrony. And so those that do breed earlier, um, they will have higher reproductive success, but they won't get the penalty of not having been synchronous with some of their other gentoos um, in the colony. So to this, we've, we've added the fact that gentoos appear to have high phenological plasticity. The adelies have low phenological plasticity. Um, again, the gentoos are resident and the adelies are migratory. I think this plays a major role in their ability to time their breeding appropriately. A very important factor, which I won't get into, is that the gentoo penguin is more likely to relay its clutch following extreme weather events. So if the gentoo penguin um, establishes a clutch and in fact may be incubating it for several days and they get a huge blizzard and that nest is flooded, the gentoo penguin will abandon that nest and start the whole breeding cycle over again. It can actually lay a whole new two egg clutch and, and be very successful in doing that. The Adelie penguins are unable to do that and they will simply abandon breeding for the season. So we're getting far more extreme precipitation and snow events and that's really putting the Adelie penguins at a disadvantage there. And finally, and this is what I'm gonna talk about here towards the end, the gentoo penguin is, is what I would call opportunistically colonial. And therefore, um, it's a rapid colonizer of new territory. It doesn't have to breed in a colony. Whereas the Adelie penguins and the chinstrap penguins and as well appear to be obligately colonial. They, have, they appear that they have to breed in a colony. We don't find a single pair of Adelies or a single pair of chinstraps. And so this leads to, um, as I'll describe in a second, a, a small Ali effect, what we call an Ali effect for the gentoo and a very large Ali effect for the Adelie. So just to give you a sense of, of what I mean by an Ali effect, it's sort of an ecological term here. Uh, you can see this, this school, which is the main aerial predator of penguin eggs and chicks during the breeding season, flying off with an egg. That's what they do all day long, every day, the whole breeding season. Um, they are the main constraint of biological sort of breeding success uh, in the breeding season. And it turns out that small colonies are more vulnerable to this nest predation than large colonies. So those breeding along the edge appear more vulnerable to school predation. 
And so this leads to what we would call an Ali effect, which is actually higher reproductive success and chick survivorship with increasing population size. So an inverse of the normal density dependence, normally larger means you're competing with more of your um, conspecifics. In this case, having a larger colony actually benefits you, their safety in numbers. And so my own interest now, really what I'm interested in looking at in the next five to 10 years, is studying the drivers of colony formation and collapse to understand the extent to which these hypothesized Lie effects may constrain rate and shifting with climate change. So if you cannot live as a single pair, if you have to be in a colony, that really constrains your ability to shift your range because it's not like the penguins can just talk to one another and say, hey, Bob, it's not looking so good here, but I hear it's really good 10 miles further south. They have no mechanism for really establishing these new colonies. It's very difficult for them to shift their ranges. What happens is that the ranges simply just shrink. So they're shrinking from the northern end, but they're not able to, to grow on the southern end. So to get at this question, you know, I'm increasingly interested in doing yacht-based expeditions to do very targeted surveys of areas that we think are maybe harboring these new uh, populations, uh, new areas of colonization. Um, we did the South Sandwich Islands in 2011. We did Deception Island in 2012. Just uh, We did the Southern Western Antarctic Peninsula in 2013. Uh, I'm not sure where we're going to go this next year. We're still deciding. But certainly the year following, we have plans to do the Northern Western Antarctic Peninsula. These are really difficult <coughs> surveys. Um, the safety review of my career has <coughs> been about eight months in the doing. Um, and that's because we work off this very small ship called the Golden Fleece. Um, this particular uh, trip to the South Sandwich Islands it was only the third um, scientific survey there ever. Um, the first to actually reach all 10 of the South Sandwich Islands. And um, these guys got to six of the 10 islands by swimming. Um, so they, they're getting, they're literally leaping off into the Southern Ocean. They, they swim ashore through these reefs and then they technical climb up these cliffs. They might do 12 hours of penguin survey work, climb down, and, and they did this every day for about a month. So um, some of this work is really, really difficult, very challenging work. Because it is so challenging, one of my main interests is in actually augmenting, or in some cases replacing the survey work with high resolution commercial satellite imagery and integrating our field work and the remote sensing to optimize this kind of regional scale biological monitoring. And these are just some of the, the sensors that I've been um, uh, working with. And in fact, there's several more new satellites going online soon that, that I'm interested in using. So just to show you what this actually looks like, uh, from the ground, this is a site called Bailey Head. This is what it looks like from a helicopter survey. And this is what it looks like from uh, high resolution commercial satellite imagery. And you can see we actually can tell the difference between an active penguin colony and what I would call sort of an inactive or an old penguin colony. Um, so the guano stains are quite obvious and we're able to do a lot of the survey work now with satellites. People didn't know if this would be possible, and, and I showed last year that it was possible to find all four of the penguins breeding on the peninsula through satellite imagery. So the three pygacelid penguins and then the macaroni penguin here. Um, and, and you can see that the signatures of breeding actually depend sensitively on the species and the time of year. So we're not yet, although we hope to be soon, to the point where computers can do this. At this point, this is just like old-fashioned photo interpretation. This requires people with experience in these areas knowing what they're looking at. Sometimes we can see individual penguins on the snow. And in fact, these images I clipped right out of Google Earth. Um, I've been collaborating with Google uh, on a number of projects, but we, we make sure, uh, myself in the Polar Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota, make sure that Google Earth know what the best images are that are coming in from the Antarctic so that they can put them into Google Earth. And this is uh, what the colony looks like on October 5th. And just two months later, you can see that now we're looking at a big pile of poop. But that's OK. I mean, most of what I do is, is look through the imagery for big piles of, of poop. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not glorious, but uh, in any case. Um, what's pretty remarkable is that we can distinguish different species where they breed contiguously. And so here we're looking at macaroni penguins nesting among chinstrap penguins on an island called Zavadovsky Island. This is what it actually looks like. There's something upwards of a million breeding pairs of penguins at this site. Um, but you can see that the macaroni penguins, because they have a different posture and they cluster together, are distinguishable both in photos and in the satellite imagery. And that gives us some hope that we can analyze some of these really super mega colonies um, using satellites as well. This was uh, some, some results that came out of uh, that Deception Island expedition that we did. 
And we just happened uh, to have a paired set of images from 2003 and 2010 of this area called Bailey Head. And using the satellite imagery, uh, my plus or minus probably turned into symbols as they usually do, but um, I estimated from the satellite imagery 85,290 plus or minus um, this here. And the plus or minus really has to do with our models of nesting density. And we find a 39% decline since 2003. So in 2010, we got 52,274 breeding pairs. So very strong evidence that this population was, was declining rapidly. But what's remarkable is that this satellite image was taken at the same time as we had folks in the field actually doing the on the ground counts. And what we got from the on the ground counts, and these two estimates have shared no information, they were totally independent estimates. We got 50,408 breeding pairs, plus or minus 2,500. So these are delis or? Uh, sorry, these are chin straps. So to give you a sense of the scale of efficiency <laughs> increases from the satellite imagery, this on the field count took us tw uh, 12 person weeks and $75,000. This estimate from the satellite imagery took me four hours and it cost me nothing. And we got estimates of the breeding population that were completely indistinguishable. And so it gives you a sense of what we're, we're trying to do now. In fact, um, a colleague and I are working on the first um, global estimate of a Delhi penguin population using high resolution commercial satellite imagery. And so we hope to be able to say in July or August, you know, how many breeding pairs of Adelis are there in the world. And this is a follow on study to my colleague's work on emperors. So we can actually watch these penguin colonies disintegrate as a, as a result of climate change in real time, which is something that we just couldn't do before. We didn't have this bird's eye view. And so to, to contrast, uh, this is what penguin biogeography looked like circa 1999. These are hand-drawn sketch maps. Now, we can map penguin colonies to 40 or 50 centimeter resolution over their entire global range. Um, it really, it still gives me you know, goosebumps to think about what's possible now that we couldn't do just even five or 10 years ago. And so my, my own interest in what my, my career award work will focus on is actually making this link between biological process at the individual nest scale all the way up to the biological patterns we see at the metapopulation scale. And it's making models that actually span these spatial scales from, from the very smallest dynamics all the way up to the very largest dynamics of occupancy over the regional scale. And for those of you that, that, that may have thought about these, these things uh, in the past, um, when I see this pattern in the satellite imagery, I, imme I immediately start thinking about the kind of self-organized patterns that have been found in other biological systems. And it turns out that, that there's strong reason to think that these patterns really are some kind of a Turing instability, um, some kind of activator inhibitor system, which is leading to patterns in the penguins um, that's very similar to, for example, what's been found in vegetation and arid ecosystems. And there's a lot of sort of math, very interesting math. I'll be hiring a, a, an applied mathematician, a postdoc, to, to study this problem. But there's some really interesting dynamics going on here that I think we just haven't been able to study in the past because we didn't have that kind of bird's eye picture of what these spatial patterns were in penguin colonies. So to, to finish it off here, um, uh, there's a whole suite of things which actually make the Gentoo penguin a real climate change winner and that make the Adeli penguin a real climate change loser. To which people always start worrying about population extinction among the Adeli penguin. And to that, I'd like to point out that even though it's a climate change winner, the total global population of the Gentoo penguin is only about 387,000 breeding pairs. While the Adeli penguin here has a total population size of four to five million breeding pairs. Um, and whereas this is considered near threatened, although I disagree with that, the, the Adeli penguin is considered a least concern. So none of these patterns that we're talking about indicate imminent extinction of any of these species, it's really just telling us something about the functioning of the underlying ecosystem in which these species live. So I haven't talked a lot about chin straps, and chin straps in many ways have been sort of an inconvenient truth, sort of the fly in the ointment to many people's conceptions of how the Antarctic ecosystem works. And this is what we thought, people thought, um, sort of going back to the late 80s, and this is called the sea ice hypothesis, was that clearly climate change would favor open water species, the gentoo and the chinstrap, and it would cause a deli decline. And this is, for almost 30 years, people were interpreting all of the data coming out of the system in light of this, that clearly a deli would be declining and clearly chinstraps and gentoos would have to be increasing. 
It turns out that what's going on is not that at all. The chin straps are in fact declining and now declining more rapidly than the delis. And so the old paradigm is really out the window. That was called the sea ice hypothesis. It's been put forward that a new paradigm has been suggested to me when I presented this work that the new paradigm might be between offshore foraging species and inshore foraging species. And that offshore foraging species may be competing with a rebounding population of humpback whales in this area. And that, in fact, maybe the inshore foraging gentoos are simply not competing with that rebounded population. But I, I, I think, and I, and I hope I've, I've convinced you that perhaps maybe it's just a whole suite of life history traits that really differentiate those with rigid life history traits with those with flexible life history traits. And the fact that the gentoo penguin has a broader diet um, is, is not strictly colonial. Um, it has a more flexible breeding phenology. Um, it can relay its clutch after a major weather event. That these are all traits that grow into the suite of characteristics that make it very adaptable, very plastic, and that that may be what makes it capable of adapting to climate change in this area. And that chin straps and delis simply don't have those traits. And so it's not any one factor, it's really a whole suite of, of factors that, that make this distinction between the climate change winners and the climate change losers. And so I'll just finish up by, by quoting here from, from that story of the, uh, the oak in the willows, or the oak in the reeds, um, better to yield when it is folly to resist than to resist stubbornly and be destroyed. And I think that's sort of the take home message of the Pi Salad penguins. And that is when I thank all the people that were involved in the field work and our logistics and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you. It's a great question. So the question is, why, if the gentoos are so flexible, if they're really the winners here, why weren't they the winners all along? Why are their populations so small? Um, the the gentoo penguins are very boom and bust. And so it appears that when the conditions are stable, uh, they, they're not that successful. And under really stable conditions, um, that, they, that sort of boom and bust lifestyle is not serving them, them well. And in fact, um, Further north of the Falkland Islands, they have this very boom and bust lifestyle, and their populations on average are about steady. But in areas where the, where the environment is highly uncertain, they seem to thrive in that very highly uncertain environment um, in a way that the others are not. Um, and I think that when you look at the latitudinal range over which gentoos are able to live, there's actually incredibly little land mass in that, in that area because it spans the very southern tip of South America and the very northern tip of the Antarctic. And I think they would be more abundant, but there's just not much land, literally, in this sort of latitudinal range in which they're sort of adapted. So, yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, you're not monitoring schools, which are a major predator. Yes. And uh, are they on the upbound, uh, which would have a really bad impact on, on shrinking colonies. Uh, and secondly, about schools, yeah. are, are the egg sizes vastly different so that it's easier for a school to carry out one type of egg than another? And then my other question is, what about krill, commercial krill fishing? Is that having an impact in this island environment? Right, uh, good question. So the first questions were about, about schools, and we're not tracking school populations in part because they breed sort of right towards the end of when we're in the field, sort of March, and uh, we just don't have access to those areas. But we don't find that their populations increase when the penguin populations increase because for, let's say, eight months of the year, they're feeding on marine resources that are not changing. And so while there's a glut of food for them in the summer, it's not enough for, they're sort of limited by the other eight months of the year where they're foraging on, not on penguin eggs and chicks. Um, the egg sizes of the three pygocells are pretty similar, so that's not a big difference, but we do find that Adelis and chin straps are more vulnerable just because they're smaller. So uh, I, should have, I should have shown sort of how they stack up, but the Gen 2 really is, 
you know, maybe 10% larger, and that's just enough that it seems that they're able to defend themselves. They certainly fall victim to them, but I think that they are able to defend themselves better. Um, and then about the krill, so some of my work is I'm in a, in a working group for people that study krill predators, and, and I'm in charge of sort of all of the, the penguin abundance information in this part of the world. And the idea is, is that we want to be able to construct estimates of abundance that are spatially explicit because they're trying to design, uh, what is it, special sub-management units, SMUs or uh, what have you, so that we can actually, instead of having a broad scale krill quota, we can actually break up the quota into certain areas and actually say, well, there are more penguins in this area so that the quota is gonna be smaller. Um, it's very controversial as to whether or not krill fishing is having an impact. Um, you know, I don't think we know. I just, there's so, the, the data as to how much krill are actually being fished is so tightly held um, that, uh, for example, the World Wildlife Fund got a grant from a krill fishery that wanted to be considered sustainable. And they approached me because they wanted all of our penguin data, but they weren't allowed to share with us their krill data. And so there's this, the krill data do not actually leak into the sort of traditional scientific community in a way that can be useful to these models, unfortunately. Um, you mentioned uh, potential IUCN delisting of the Gen 2. Yeah. Um, do you think that that would have an impact on, on stabilizing or helping the adult penguin populations? Because they, they co-share a, a lot of that habitat, right? Right. Um, so what would a, would a delisting do functionally for, for that situation? What's tricky is that I think one of the reasons that people have been very concerned about the Gentoos is that in the Falkland Islands, where they have maybe about a third of their global populations in the Falkland Islands, they're very sensitive to uh, oiling and competition with the fisheries up there. And, and so there is a concern that if they were to be delisted, it would, it would negatively impact those Falkland Island populations. But um, I'm kind of a, a, a straight down the line about this. In a way, I look at the IUCN criteria, which for the penguins are very, very specific. There's five criteria. And the gentoo penguins don't meet any of them. In fact, it's not even close. I can't even figure out how they got listed in the first place. Um, but really, you know, I've just been arguing that, you know, if we're gonna reevaluate the you know, all of the penguins and their status, that we really need to be honest that the gentoo penguins no longer meet these criteria. I'm not sure they ever did, um, but there's not many people arguing to upgrade species. It tends to be the focus on the other way around. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, good. Uh, talk about the temperature uh, relationship between the temperature and the population of the two uh, species. Mm -hmm. Or is there always a positive relationship between the temperature and the gentoo uh, population? Um, it's a very, well, for the gentoo populations, it's very closely tied to the breakup of the sea ice. And so as the Western Antarctic Peninsula gets warmer and warmer, the spring sea ice breaks up earlier and earlier. And so at that sort of crucial time where there are deciding where to breed or establishing their colonies, there's now more area in which they're they're able to breed. More specifically for the season of 2019, yeah. uh, would that season be normally warmer than the ecology or really record show that that season for temperature? Oh, uh, for deception. Um, uh, I see what you said with the chin straps. Yeah, with the chin straps. We actually, so, so I only showed two time points because that was the data that we had available for Bailey Head. There's another colony that's at that same island that's somewhat smaller that shows the same overall trends, but actually we have, we have more information filling in the gaps. It's a slightly smaller population. So we think that that, that decline is sort of real. And in fact, uh, going even further back to the 1987, there was, a, I think, an over 50% decline since 87 two-thirds of which we think has been in the last six years. So we actually had a couple different pieces of information, but you're right that we have to be very careful when assessing just two years um, because there is so much interannual variability that I'd be, I'd be hard-pressed to say something unless it was you know, a 90% decline or something really obvious um, because there is so much variability in just two years. Yeah. Yes, uh, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, actually, uh, I thought that uh, They are, yes, but they're not spatially specific at this point. So they don't monitor, or they they uh, they, they do they do monitor. I would say that that's actually there's a huge amount of secrecy on both ends. So 
the, the krill fisheries, um, the, so there's a, there's a huge amount of illegal fishing, but the, the krill fisheries report to CAMLAR, which is the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. But CAMLAR is not allowed to release those, those information to other scientists. And so I think CAMLAR actually have those data, um, but, but scientists like myself can't get access to it. So that's kind of the deal, is that CAMLAR gets to see it, but only if they don't share that with other people. Yes. Ah. And I think you should be much more uncomfortable about that and share that discomfort. Well, I, I will say that actually understanding where the genting penguins are coming from in these <coughs> new colonies is one of the most exciting areas of research as far as I'm concerned. And so I'm collaborating with a with the geneticist who's actually going to be coming. I hope he'll give a seminar um, when he does come called Tom Hart, who's at Oxford University in the London Zoo. And he and I have been working together on genetic studies of these three pygocelids. Um, over this entire range. And we found all sorts of interesting things about, about their genetics. But one of the things we've been doing is really actively collecting genetic data at the southern range margin. Because these are so site faithful that even neighboring sites have different genetic signatures. And so we hope to be able to understand what the source populations are for these newly established colonies. Um, so we have those data in hand. We're just sort of working our way through the, through the analysis. Um, but but I think genetics is the key here because we're not banning them and there are, there are no banning programs really south of the South Shetland Islands at this point um, to kind of answer those questions about where those penguins are coming from. Yeah. yeah. Kind of following that, I was wondering what the site, site fidelity of the Gen 2s and the Adelis is, how they compare. You know, I, I mean, in both cases, it's, it's incredibly high, like 97%. Um, it's so high that it's, it's really hard to, it's really hard to measure. Um, so there have been cases in the Falkland Islands, my colleague has found that a particular site that was nearly wiped out by a disease, a particular breeding population, still shows evidence of that sort of inbreeding 20 and 30 years later, that because there's just so little immigration, even from colonies that might be a mile away, um, it's, it's amazingly little. And so that's what's so surprising, is I don't know who's moving to these new colonies. I don't know who they are. Um, I don't know if they're juveniles or they're adults. I don't know if there are just there's just one source population or, or not. And, and so the genetics, I'm hoping, will will solve these problems. Yeah. I was kind of I was wondering if there's, you know, if it could be, you know, if they're if they're really faithful to their site unless conditions change somehow. That you know, if there's yes. a good one opens up, there. Oh, okay, we'll just abandon it over there or right. And that has been what they found in the Ross Sea. So other studies in the Ross Sea where they've, they've found exactly that. On an average year, we have incredibly high rates of site fidelity. But when, when if there's a particular year, there was a big problem in an iceberg that blocked up one of the major Delhi colonies, that they had huge amounts of, of emigration away from that site. And so it might be that it's really hard to even find in a sort of a, a more traditional banding study, because you have to find that one year where they all decide to go somewhere else. Um, a colleague of mine uh, who's actually uh, working for me this year from the University of Minnesota was on that, just uh, co-first author on that big paper on emperor penguins that some of you may be familiar with. It was the first global census of a species ever. And they counted all the emperor penguins in the world from satellites. And they found that there was one particular colony that got wiped out by a glacier. I'm sorry, so an iceberg wiped out the, the, the breeding colony. And they've been looking and they've been looking and they have found this colony slowly reappearing in a new place. And, um, but it took several years, and that process of reestablishment of the colony is something I'm really interested in. Like, how does that happen? Like, how do you wipe out an entire breeding population and, and reform it somewhere else when you highly colonial species? I, I'm fascinated by it. So I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, how many weather stations or meteorological stations are there on the peninsula? Oh, on the peninsula, um, I think about probably five or six. Um, uh, and and one of the longest running ones is that one that's at, at Bernaski Station that used to be Faraday Station, and that um, uh, it's a good thing that that they've been keeping such careful climate records for such a long time because it actually turns out to be you know one of the most impressive increases in temperature. Um, but those are manned stations. There are, there are several more unmanned stations. Okay. Well, so let us thank you all for, for such a nice Thank you.